Hello and welcome to Ian and Friends. I am Ian Dilly, Senior Editor of Flow Bikes. And I am here with my friend, Michael Sheehan. Hello, thank you for joining us. Yeah, how's everything going, Michael? Great, uh, you just got back from another vacation, which I, uh, you did not invite me on again. This is a recurring theme in our show, is Ian goes on vacations and doesn't invite Michael. Well, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I don't know if you would have been able to hang. It was a pretty important gravel race that I competed in, uh, Fish Rock gravel okay. race in, uh, Petal or outside of Petaluma, California. It was up in Mendocino Ca County, uh, 70 miles, almost 10,000 feet of climbing. And we were actually out there shooting a video series with Allison Tetrick, Allison Tetrick's ultimate guide to gravel. I'm not sure if you're aware, but she is the gravel queen. She is the winner of the world's biggest gravel race, Dirty Kanza. I've heard of it. Yep. Uh, I believe you will be competing in it this year. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck I, to you. I am registered. Thank you. Sounds like a long day. Yeah, but uh, we had a great time out there. Uh, we actually saw your teammate. Mm -hmm. Amity. Yes, Amity Gregg was there. She was having a bit of a, a rough day. I actually ended up with her at aid station number two. Um, she was enjoying a frosty beverage while I was uh, pounding, shoveling quesadillas into my face. So she beat you to the aid station? Uh, she arrived shortly after me, uh, left before, climb. and made it over the major climb before me, and then I passed her on the descent. She had actually uh, broken her bike. Yeah, uh, she had a few mechanicals. Yeah. I, I understand that's yeah, no, it was uh, yeah. <laughs> No fault to the bicycle manufacturer. It was, it was uh, a demanding course of like actually a really brutal, rocky descent. So yeah. anyways, it was a good time. Uh, and we have a clip here of the teaser for our video series with Allison Tetrick. Um, it's when it comes to that. race day, you just go as hard as you can. Welcome to week seven through nine. Oh, nine through seven. Cheers to moderation. Cycling teaches us humility. Be willing to face a little fear, a little bit of failure, because that's kind of the beauty of the sport. Yeah, gravel's hot right now. <laughs> this is going to be a really fun video series. Allison takes us through a nine-week training program, um, everything you need to do to prepare for a major gravel race from the physical standpoint. She offers tips and tricks, things she's learned a lot along the way, transitioning from being a pro road racer like mm -hmm. yourself to becoming a gravel and adventure racing specialist. And That's what we're all doing. I just, I just had a conversation with Ted King about the exact same thing. Yeah, I mean, and why not? Like, uh, it's a super fun and engaging racing. It's great for sponsors. There's thousands of people there participating, some being highly competitive about it, some just there for fun, like myself, eating quesadillas at the rest stop. That's what it's all about. So <laughs> will this video series be out in time for me to learn what I need to learn going into cancer. We're expecting the first <laughs> we're expecting the first uh, video to drop in a couple weeks and okay. yeah you can you can get signed up on the house and Tetric training plan and uh, be be prepared for Kanza as, as, as much as possible. Good because I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Um, <laughs> all right so we also have road racing to talk about though. What are we talking about today? Well, we had an exciting weekend of road racing. We had the first monument of the season on the men's world tour, the mm -hmm. Milan San Remo. And on Flow Bikes, we streamed the third women's world tour event of the season, a classic unto itself, Trofeo Alfredo Binda, which was won by American Corinne Rivera in 2017. Mm -hmm. And that was a phenomenal race. So let's go over each race and then at the end, we're going to ask which race was better because it was actually a tough call. There was a lot of people saying that Milan San Remo was one of the most exciting and um, surprising finales of all time. But, you know, I would argue what we saw at Trofea Binda was uh, right up there in terms I of I don't excitement. think it's actually that close of a call. <laughs> <laughs> so so what did we say at Milan San Remo? It's a seven and a half hour bike it is race. Quite long. Did, did you watch all of it, <laughs> start to finish? Yeah, you, you, <laughs> I, you sat down on the couch for seven, for seven and a half. Set my alarm for two a.m. 
Um, no, there's no reason to tune in to Milan San Remo no. in, until they hit the base of the Poggio. Yeah, I mean, you always kind of tune in for the depressing. You're like, oh, something exciting will happen, but it doesn't. Yeah, and uh, it, it was it was an exciting finish, but that's it was exciting in that like there was one person who could ride his bike. <laughs> so seven hours into this, well, that's that's the beauty race. of Milan San Remo, right? It's yeah. it's what you don't necessarily see. You know, the first six hours of bike racing that makes for an exciting last uh, ten kilometers mm -hmm. is you know the 180 miles that are in these guys' legs. It makes for a, a different and predictable finish to this race and. Um, it's a beautiful race in its own right, and you know, obviously, it's a monument for a reason. But, um, but yeah, it, it, let's go through how it played out. Um, they hit the Poggio, and there's a hand, you know they're they're coming into it lead out trains like mm -hmm. it's the end of the race. Absolutely, um, Bahrain Merida on the front just drilling it, and um, a rider from the Israeli Cycling Academy? Yeah, Chris Neeland, uh, Action Hagens Berman graduate, Latvian national champion. He put in like fantastic yeah. attack, got got himself 100 meters ahead of the peloton up the Poggio. But you could kind of tell like that's where he ran out of gas and he managed to draw out Nibali. Nibali saw the that it was good timing, went up with him and it's just like a 23-year-old, really good young bike racer versus somebody who, like Nibbly, who's been doing this for just ages. Nibbly just used him up. Like, he, he somehow convinced Neelands to pull with him, and you could tell, like, Neelands was, like, uh, tasting it, <laughs> pulling Nibbly around, while Nibbly's just like, this is perfect. He just, like, wax over the top, and I, I don't know why alarm bells weren't ringing in the peloton when Nibbly attacked uh either they were just completely pickled and couldn't follow him or i i don't know yeah you know i i uh read that kwiatowski said that they they just happened to fall asleep when nibbly slipped off the front but you, you don't fall asleep when <laughs> nibbly <laughs> slips off the front he he's won the tour right. he is like known in the peloton as one of the best descenders period you let him go up the climb you're not going to catch him down the climb and then you have to have, like, a team committed to chasing on the flat at the end of San Remo for the last, like, what, 3K if you're yeah. going to catch him. Because he's, he's going to put 10 seconds on the peloton. Yeah, there was the definitely a falling asleep uh, seems to be a euphemism for, yeah, we were just cooked. We'd been racing yeah. hard as we could for seven hours and just didn't have the legs to, to go with Nibali or, yes. or Kush Nylons for that matter. Yeah, yeah so Shark Messina strikes again. I think that just really kind of shows his maturity and just he, he knows when he has to go and knows what he has to do. It was a pretty brilliant ride by him. Yeah, no, it was phenomenal so. and, and a super exciting race. Um, one that you wouldn't think that would be topped the very next day, perhaps, by Women's World Tour race. But um, let's talk about what we saw at Alfredo Binda. I mean, um, you know, this is a course uh, and condi epic conditions to mm -hmm. start. Um, raining, cold, everybody's in their wet weather gear. Um, and a course that's just super dynamic. Uh, circuits with two steep climbs on it at the end and just really phenomenal team racing. Yeah, and unlike San Remo, which was seven hours and 15 minutes, this race was more like three and a half hours and just the attacks that were flying in the last 20K of this race were pretty phenomenal. Cassia Niwanoma, she uh, put in two of the most blistering late race attacks that I've seen, and she ended up making the winning move up the final climb. <laughs> and just uh, distanced the uh, Italian champion, Eliza Borghini, who was on her wheel. She just sprinted flat out up this hill for about a minute mm -hmm. until the entire, like, lead group just tapped out. Yeah, Niwan Doma was definitely uh, the main protagonist in the race, yeah. but we saw Megan Garnier, you know, uh, with a phenomenal move off the front, um, forcing Kang and Tram to chase, and yeah, Niwan Doma's attacks were just out of this world. Let's go to a clip here of her, her winning move. They're in a small group that she had um, forced off the front. We see Pauline Ferran Prevot, her teammate, Riding the front, there'd been a series of attacks by her teammates to, to set up this move and really wear down the group. Um, and we see uh, PFP do a, 
a beautiful ponytail whip here. I, I think that this is actually like that. That means attack. That's which the he's go. About to do. Yeah. Th this is. All right. Hang moves on, no. moves the hair off the shoulder. That's go. Go, Cassia. Go. <laughs> <laughs> And Borghini, this is the Italian champion, Borghini. She was on her wheel. She saw her stand up and about to go, and that is just how much of a gap that she put on instantly. And Borghini's like, closing, closing, closing. Taps out. Yeah. Can't do it. Yeah. Cannot do. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and Niwa Doma went know. like this the whole way up the climb, and then the way she went down the descent was just phenomenal uh, as well. Uh, I mean, wet and slick and hairpins. Um, I mean, th this was getting just tons of love on social media. Kwiatowski, her um, you know fellow Polish, Polish. bike racer, yeah. was uh, giving her shout outs. Yeah, just an amazing ride. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, I think I think it was a lot more exciting than San Remo, personally. I'm I'm with Trofea Bindo uh, as well. I didn't think I was. I, I thought that Milan San Remo maybe couldn't be topped um, for a while. Maybe not this spring. You know. Um, the unexpectedness of how that played out, but just to watch bike racing and tactics and um, yeah, it's just w everything you would want out of a bike race played out at Trofea Binda. Yeah. All right. Um, let's move on to your recent article. Um, you know, I was looking at the results from Cycle Cross Worlds, uh, obviously a, a month or so ago, and I noticed that um, when you're looking at the lower categories, the junior races, the under 23 races on both the men's and women's side, the Belgians are not dominating. You know, they're uh, you know going eight out of the top 10 in the men's elite race, but in these lower categories in the women's races, you know, you think that Belgium is the heartland of cyclocross, but mm -hmm. the sport is really becoming much more internationalized. You're seeing. Um, you know, the UK win the junior men's race, win the under 23 women's race. And, um, you know, as you pointed out in your article, <clears throat> I think the top Belgian in the men's under or junior race was eighth. Yeah, they, I don't think that they've gotten a podium in the junior men's world championship race in the last two or three years. So, you know, you look at the lead race, and like you said, it's just stacked. Top 10 is almost all Belgium and a bit of Dutch. But it, it was an interesting point you brought up, just what is happening? Why do we have this, like, really just, like, big depth of an international field in the younger categories? And then what's happening to just allowing Belgium to just dominate the lead race when all these kids grow up? And I sat down with Jeff Proctor, who's the head of USA Cyclocross, to kind of pick his brain. Mm -hmm. In this article, he offered uh, some really good insight. And he said, like, Belgium, it emphasizes a multidisciplinary approach to cycling. So these kids, they are they're racing everything. Like, uh, you're seeing Belgian guys race road, cycle cross track uh, there's not like really one focus in their development and then they kind of have the infrastructure to support these kids growing up picking either cycle cross so there's a viable cycle cross career path there's a viable road career path uh, mountain bike etc after the junior ranks and we don't really have that as much in America he said though like in America we emphasize Olympic disciplines and I think that like the, my biggest takeaway from this article is we need to get cyclocross in the Winter Olympics. We've been talking about that for the last 10 years. There's like a pesky rule that says that Olympic winter sports need to be played out on snow and ice. And there's, I think, a lot of movement trying to just change the wording of that one rule to allow cyclocross into the sport. And that would really blow up the elite categories in terms of just getting like a whole spattering of nationalities competing for you know top honors and yeah. world championships etc yeah let, let's change the rule to snow ice and slush or snow ice and mud maybe yeah uh, <laughs> so we can include <laughs> oh, cyclocross or, or just practiced in winter yeah it, you know like that's that's really it it doesn't have to be like a skiing like going down a mountain on snow it's just like cyclocross is a winter sport Right, yeah. right, right. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's a really interesting point in terms of there being a viable career path for young racers in Belgium that, you know, they might be eighth at Junior Worlds, but, you know, they stick around through under-23s and into the elite ranks, 
And you know, if you're a top 10 rider in the elite ranks in, in Belgium, you can make a good career as a cycle cross racer um, where you know, maybe there's one or two racers that can follow that career path in other countries. You know, we see in the U.S. <coughs> we have women who can have, you know, uh, dedicated themselves primarily to cross, Katie Compton, Katie mm -hmm. Keogh. But even our top men, like uh, Stephen Hyde, is now uh, pursuing a, a mountain bike career in addition to the cyclocross yeah, discipline. Because and we have Olympics coming up in, two, uh, yeah, two years now. Right. Matthew Vanderpool. Should we talk about him? He got he just raced a World Cup mountain bike race because he is also transitioning to mountain bike to prepare for Tokyo. He got right. fourth. Right. Fourth right. fourth in the <laughs> first World Cup mountain bike. He's taking a month off from racing now and he's gonna come back for the rest of the season to try to win a World Cup, which I am pumped to see. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely as a cyclocross fan. Um, it is cool to see these racers uh, participate in other disciplines, and I was, you know, actually talking with Stu Thorne, who runs the Cannondale Cyclocross World Team, about that the other day. Um, I'm I'm excited to see Stephen Hyde race mountain bikes, um, and that's uh, piquing my interest in in domestic mountain bike racing mm -hmm. and, and and following his his path. So yeah, and that just emphasizes the draw of the Olympic discipline. These guys want to be Olympians. They want to get an Olympic medal, and it would be sweet to see cyclocross. Yeah. Like right up there, like on par with the rest of these. You know sports. that you know that they would have the best crowds of all the Olympic disciplines. Yeah, it would be great. <laughs> like Jeff Proctor's said in like a past interview, just close the Olympics with a cyclocross race in the Olympic Village, and everybody would come out. It yeah. would be a spectacle, if nothing else. <laughs> it would be so sweet. So um, yeah, let's start a pet another petition for that. <laughs> the one doesn't already exist. Uh, I think that it comes up like every Olympic year, but like we need to keep the momentum going we'll start for the next four likes. years. Yeah. yeah. All right. Pay uh, attention, IOC. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never did our show rundown at the start of the show. Uh, we just kind of dived in, um, but we are going to talk about. Um, the Tour of the Alps, which is a stage race we have coming up on Flow Bikes Live. It's got a great lineup. We're going to go through that. And we are also going to finish off with a video of bike fights. More bike fights. <laughs> Guess who? You can never have enough <laughs> bike fights. Yeah. Uh, but first, I want to thank the uh, winners of our first coffee mug contest. My mug comes from Miles Sharp. And Laura Putnam sent this in from Detroit. Thank you, Laura. So I uh, appreciate that. And um, when we have this show on the site, we'll have show notes and you can, uh, we'll, we'll tell you the address at which to send Flow Bikes your um, favorite coffee mug and it can appear on yeah. and It friends. will be featured. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we will drink from them. Yeah. I'd just like to point out that mine says Muppet News and this is actually Kermit the Frog dressed as a as a journalist, so. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, Tour of the Alps. Where are we at, okay. Tour of the Alps. Um, this is a little ways out. We, it's about three weeks until Tour of the Alps starts, April 16th through 20th, but I did want to bring it up. Um, a, because we're super excited about having this race on Flow Bikes. It's going to be a phenomenal field. We've already got um, Fabio Aru and Thibaut Pino and a lot of the top Giro d'Italia contenders uh, use this race. It's formerly known as the Giro Delta Trentino as a test event for the um, for the Giro d'Italia. It's um, short stages, like 140 kilometers long, just packed with mountains. I think over the five-day stage race, there are three mountaintop finishes. Um, maybe one semi-flat stage, so uh, it'll definitely be exciting racing. Um, the last three editions were all won by Sky, uh, Durant Thomas, Mikel Landa, and Richie Port, and that sort of brings up the, uh, the elephant in the room. <laughs> Chris Room has been rumored to be on the start line of the Tour of the Alps. Yeah, we do <laughs> want to give credit to Vela News. They broke that yeah. story. Yeah, thank you, Vela News. Um, and yeah, we'll see. There's, of course, just like controversy continually swirling around Team Sky. I personally am not surprised by this at all. It, it's just, it's Team Sky's MO. It's like, it's not against the rules, so we're doing it. And yeah, so Chris Froome can race, so he's going to race. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I don't think very many people are happy with this situation. I'm personally not happy. I, it, 
I'm, I'm torn, actually, personally. As I, I love watching Chris Froome race, you mm -hmm. know? Um, he's a phenomenal bike racer. Even though he looks at his stem 90% of the bike race, he's, he's come a long way just in terms of his ability to handle a bike, you know, uh, the way he can rail descents these days. And I've became a massive Chris Froome fan, actually, over the last, like, two years, watching him kind of win the tour, not just by going yeah. fast until everybody was dropped at the he's hill. He's become he's, a complete bike racer. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. And so, and so, when Chris Froome is at a bike race, you know, I think we all get excited about that. But yeah, having this hanging over our head, his his pending suspension, and you know, this case about his Sobimal, it's um, it just it, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth having him line up. I want to know what the hang up is. What's um, how is this like a gray area? I, I, I still don't totally understand. Yeah, I I, uh, I was recently reading on, on Cycling News uh -huh. uh, that um, it's basically a battle of lawyers at this point. Sky has some powerful lawyers. Yeah. Uh, the UCI and Water are involved with their lawyers. And um, there's some sort of standoff going on. And um, it likely will not be resolved until after the Giro, you know, if, if, if resolved at all. So who knows, but um, needless to say, he's gonna be going toe to toe, you know, on form for the Giro with some of the top, you know, uh, general classification riders in the world. And so uh, it, it's gonna be exciting. I, I think uh, there'll be a lot of people tuning in on it, slow bikes. It is, and just like one more point on that that I'm really interested in is just seeing how Froome rides because the mental just pressure that he is under. I, I don't know how that ca guy can get up and train because his name is in the news every day about something that he just like does not want to hear about. He's, he's not a very popular person right now in the sport, but he's lining up to these races. He's still racing well, he's still doing his job. And like, I'm kind of impressed just by the discipline that that takes and right. seeing how the pressure of these bigger races is gonna treat him with like all this stuff that's going right. on in his personal life. It's, it's interesting, and it's kind of a study in just like the psychology of an elite athlete, if nothing else. Yeah, I mean, you know, we always say happy bike racers are fast bike racers, yeah. and I can't imagine that Chris Froome is all that happy right now. So, um, yeah, it's I, I, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes and, and, and facing that and try, <laughs> trying, to, trying to do your job and, and, and enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, so let's get that wrapped up fast. Yeah, for sure. So. Maybe be, maybe before the Tour of the Alps. Yeah, that, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> um, all right. We're going to finish off with our uh, clip of uh, this fight that occurred at the Tour of Lenkawi. I would like so. to note that um, there was a winner to this race. Adam DeVos. Yeah. Rally, rally Cycling. Uh, homeboy on Rally Cycling. Good, good bike racer. Really cool. He's... He's Canadian, but we'll forgive him. It's <laughs> it's good to see an American team come out on top uh, when they're overseas always. And yeah, good ride by Adam there. Yeah, so I don't necessarily want uh, this uh, sensational video clip to overshadow what Adam did, but we're gonna play the video clip yeah. anyways. Uh, apparently there was a altercation during the race that boiled over and um, one rider threw a bottle at another uh, the race ended, and uh, this is what resulted. He threw a bike! <laughs> Picked up the bike <laughs> and used it as a weapon. Um, I don't, we've seen a lot of bike throws in, in, in our day. Uh, I, I've I don't never seen I've... a bike thrown at another bike racer. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that happen. <laughs> and it's, it's this giant team that's from, I, I don't know if it's from China or Hong Kong or something, but I've raced against them. They are so aggro. Yeah. They're super aggro in the race. Like, this is like the same thing. We touched on this at Tour of Henan, which I was at, and there was another Chinese rider who got in a fight with, like, the entire Swiss national team yeah. after the stage. It's, what are what is in these guys' bottles? Like, why are they so angry all the time? <laughs> <laughs> like, they just yeah yeah, it, yeah I yeah it's uh it's interesting. Maybe they're just taking it a little bit too seriously. Uh, something like that. So yeah, more bike fights out of Asia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that concludes our show for today. Send us your coffee mugs, and we'll see you next time on Ian and Friends. Thanks for joining. <laughs>